welcome to the elephant meets. Um, so we are the elephant in the room, or there is an elephant in the room, and today we're meeting someone who can help us uh, discern the shape of that uh, presence in the room, the big system, the big next system. And that person is Sabra Williams. Wave, Sabra, give them a wave so they can see you. Okay. Sabra Williams is founder and director of the California-based uh, Creative Acts, uh, she's of this parish, but she's been there for a number of years. And Creative Acts, in its own self-description, says it seeks to transform social justice issues through the revolutionary power of the arts. Uh, and that's specifically, but not exclusively, through the prison system in California. Uh, before that, Sabra co-founded the Actors Gang Prison Project. Um, Tim Robbins is part of that. And she was also named a champion of change by President Obama in 2016, beat that, uh, given a British Empire Medal in 2018 for services to uh, prison reform. And she even recently wrote a piece with Jane Fonda for the Washington Post. So you are in the presence of some substance. So Sabra, welcome to The Elephant Meets. Welcome to The Alternative UK. Thank you. I'm glad I'm not the elephant, although after this coronavirus lockdown, I sometimes feel like it. <laughs> okay, uh, hardly. Um, briefly, how we're going to do this uh, is basically we're going to sort of flip between current events and the way that what you do is maybe providing some answers or some insights to that. But to sort of begin, basically, very subjectively, how are you feeling about the last fortnight? How, how has it landed at your feet? Um, can I just start by saying that if I, I'm talking to you from uh, Tacoma, Washington, mm. I live in Los Angeles, but um, anybody who's in America right now is on stolen, looted land. And so the land that I'm on in Tacoma is actually the uh, Puyallup tribe. It's their land and um, I want to acknowledge them and uh, we will do better, the Native people. So that's where I want to start. And I think that kind of is where I am, or I have been in these last few weeks, that uh, recognizing that where we are today is the result of uh, the blood, sweat, and tears, and the lives <clears throat> of people who have largely been invisible. And um, I feel both grief and incredible excitement. I think this is the, the best opportunity of certainly of my lifetime, of a generation to make real systemic change in this world. So yeah, excited and definitely full of grief. Okay. And I mean, and I think it's, the, it's become a global event. I think this is one of the most, it's the most extraordinary thing, don't you think about the last few weeks, is that this has become something that the world has picked up. Hmm. And the and the world is the sort of feels that it's implied in in this. You know, it's not just a local news report. It's now become a global event. Yes, and I, I think that um, that's because people somewhere inside recognise what this uprising is about. And you know, it's not the first time that we've had an uprising, but uh, and it probably won't be the last time. But I do feel like. It's uh, ignited this, this uh, uncomfortableness across the world with a lot of especially white people starting to wake up to the reality that has been hidden just below the surface from them, not from us, and has been talked about, fought over, millions of films and books and, you know, podcasts have been made about just this subject but it was like for 400 years you know knocking at a door and people couldn't hear with like little tiny peaks like you know the civil rights movement seemed like people could finally some people could finally hear this seems very widespread it seems that um you know the injustice that happened when it happened i think because of having a pandemic and you know uh George Floyd being killed at the same time and Ahmed Aubrey being killed at the same time, people were in a space where um, we were already having to reimagine what the world might be like. We were already sure. quieter 
Sure. And we were able to receive this thing in a way that there was no escape from it. So I think that's why it's ignited in the way it has. Mm. And just to do the thing, the, the flip I said I was going to do at the beginning between your, your experience of where you are and what you actually do. What's, what's the kind of first touch point where we chat yesterday and you said a great line, which I've just written down. And I'll repeat to you because it's a great okay. line. Um, <laughs> yeah. Prison is where race meets injustice. Prison is where race meets injustice. Could you just riff, riff on that a wee bit? Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say that um, before I moved to America, I was born and brought up in the UK. And um, obviously being a woman of colour growing up anywhere that is founded in white supremacy, you're very aware of who you are from a very young age and how other people receive you. Um, <clears throat> but I think that I did partially buy into the American dream or like what America says it is. And so when we emigrated here and um, I joined the Actors Gang, Tim Robbins Theatre Company, and I started to work in a, this ancient European style of Commedia dell'arte and started to see how it was affecting me. I remember that when I was in the UK, I'd worked in prisons with the English Shakespeare Company and had started to see, oh, this is not how I thought it was. You know, these aren't, this isn't what we're sold by the press and by, you know, general conversation that it's not people who've behaved badly. It's a certain community of people who are targeted for behaving in many ways the same way as many of the rest of us do, who are living in communities that aren't targeted. And so when I came to America and I started to learn about mass incarceration, at that time, what was happening in the so-called justice system was very hidden. So, you know, uh, The New Jim Crow, the book by Michelle Alexander, I think had not come out yet or was just starting to emerge. And so the actual data behind who gets incarcerated and why and how the, the so-called justice system affects certain communities and how it's not a level playing field was not that well known. And you know, the simple fact of America has 5% of the world's population, 25% of the world's incarcerated population. So <clears throat> I think, you know, understanding over the years by the greatest teachers anyone could have who are my partners inside starting to understand that, you know, oh, communities that have not been invested in, poor, black, indigenous, brown communities already are living in a completely different world. And so when they interact with the, the system, they live in, in over-policed communities. So the interaction with the system is much more common. The expectation of going to prison is generational. And then when people get incarcerated and then try to come back to the community, the trauma that they go in with is also magnified by trying to come back. So that's what I mean when I say prison is where, you know, race and injustice meet in prison. Because if you ever go to a prison and I advise everybody, you are paying for prison, you should go and see what your tax dollars and tax pounds are going to. You should go see, it will wake you up. It's black, brown, indigenous, and poor people. That's the prison population in its entirety. Hmm. There was a phrase you said that I just wanted to pick you up on. You said, my partner's inside. What do you, what do you mean by that? Oh, <laughs> it's funny because even inside prison, prison is like a magnifying glass of what happens in society, right? So inside, even inside prison, even with all the good intentions of people coming in, bringing programs, there's still a kind of a colonization that happens. There's still a lot of people going inside prison to bring in programs or to work who are not doing their work, right? So they're going in, like I hear a lot of times, oh, there, but for the grace of God, go I, and that's just not true. That is just absolutely not true because you would probably have a good lawyer. You are, most of the people that run programs inside have, you know, white skin, white exterior, white presenting. And so you would not, it's not there but for the grace of God. And that in itself brings on this savior complex of, you know, and I hear it in the way people talk quite often of, you know, going inside and, you know, 
I brought in this program and I taught them this and I empowered them. All of that is colonial talk. And that's what happens in Cyprus prison too. So when I first started going in there, I didn't know, I've never been incarcerated. Nobody in my family has been incarcerated. So I did not know what I was going into. So I had to um, make a decision to be honest about that, to be honest about my privilege, and then to be able to learn from people who have had that experience. And I guess that's, you know, I call them my partners because that's exactly who they are. I am bringing in a proposal for something, for, I don't know, theater workshop or, you know, a workshop. And then they are taking the proposal and they are making it into something. And then they're feeding back to me either verbally or just by how they respond, whether this is working or not, or I need to do more of this or less of that. So it is a partnership. It's like a laboratory and I'm like starting experiment and then they're adding in another ingredient and I'm adding another ingredient. And then we might, you know, create a new vaccine for COVID. <laughs> Social vac, cultural vaccine, but <laughs> but but you were saying the other day, and uh, and that's why I put I heard, I picked up on what you'd said is that there's maybe a lesson here for how um, majority white population can can be a partner to be a friend to can help out black Americans or or be in be in anywhere yeah not help out yeah not that's help right. I've got I've got that immediately wrong right okay yeah. <laughs> No, they, white people, it's time to do your work. That's what this time is. The same as when I first went into prison and thought I knew some things, I realized, oh, I'm not here just to deliver a workshop. I'm here to work. I am mm -hmm. in this working. Because in that situation, and I always say when I go in, I'm privileged in this position. In the outside world, I'm the lowest rung of the ladder. I'm a woman of color. That is like the lowest rung of the ladder in our world right now. But in prison, I'm privileged. So I have to admit my privilege, first of all, in order for us to become partners. Because if I don't do that verbally, there's a lot of assumptions that can be made by them and by me. So I have to sit there and say, yes, hi, I am a privileged person in this situation and I'm here to partner with you. And then, I have to look at what the problems are, right? And what the root of those problems are. And the root of the problems in the justice system is white supremacy and a punishment uh, philosophy that comes out of white supremacy. So then I have to ask myself, what's my positioning in this? How am I responsible for this? And what can I do to change it? So the first thing I have to do is I have to do what I'm asking them to do. So I'm asking them to use the tools of the arts that the arts provide to uh, make a transformation inside, to do a little human revolution inside of them and to continue to use the tools, not as an artist, but to um, be able to control emotion, to make different choices, to uh, heal trauma, to have uh, you know, better coping skills and to be able, and this is a big one inside prison, to be able to see beyond race and gang affinity because inside prison, everything's divided by race. The white people stick with the white people, the black people stick with the white people, uh, black people, indigenous people stick with other indigenous people. So the room has to be a safe space with people who are all different in order for them to start to see the one thing everybody has in common, which is our humanity. But in order to do that, it's a process, right? So we talk about truth and reconciliation. First, you have to have truth. And that's the bit that people do not like. And that's what I'm seeing right now, is that you know, asking white people to do this work, because white people have been in the position of power, it's super uh, uncomfortable and brings up so much fear. You might lose something. You might lose being mm. the people on top. You know, you might lose that. You might have to face things about yourself that you don't want to do. And this is where the arts come in because it creates a safe space and gives us tools to be able to do it almost, uh, almost invisibly, almost without knowing you're doing it. Um, and so I guess that this is, we're not asking 
I'm not speaking for all people of color. I'm not asking white people to just do the work on your own. I'm not saying you guys have to do it. You guys have to fix it. We've been doing this work for 400 plus years in order to stay sane and not kill people. So we're, we are always doing the work just to, you know, I was just saying on the way up here, when we drove up from LA, we're driving through all these beautiful places and we're like, oh, we should go visit that place. And we have to have the conversation. My husband is also a man of color. We have to have the conversation. Is it safe for us? A lot of people have guns around here. It's an entirely white place. You know, would we be safe? Would we get looks? Would, you know, maybe some people would be great. Maybe some people, maybe everybody would be welcoming or maybe nobody would be welcoming. And those conversations are conversations that we have to have. So we are always having to do this work in places where you're not. So we're asking, join us. And I can tell you, being that person who's going inside, having to do extra work going inside prison, there's so much joy if you'll just do it. If you'll just admit the privilege and just start doing the work. There's so much joy in being a partner. And I think that quite a lot of people are already starting to experience mm. that. Being mm. an ally, you see people on the streets. I've never seen so many white people marching with us on the streets. And then you hear white people to the front and then people standing in front of um, people of color, like blocking them from the police. They feel good. That's a good feeling. So it's not doom and gloom, it's exciting. Mm. So and do, do you it. think so? Do you think the stuff that's that you see so you're using the arts as a tool um, for this process for this uh, transformation? Um, is it is it is it mass protest that, that that will make it work out with the prison, or do are there forms of powers of the arts that we can all get involved in, or that are that are yet to be invented that would get us into this situation? I mean, when you say do the work, it's like, it sounds like therapeutic work, but it's not, it's participatory work as well. You're, you're getting involved with things with people. What kind of things do you think those might be out with your amazing prison experiences? I mean, what, in communities, any ideas? Any ideas about how the yeah, power of the arts? Have, yeah. a lot of, um, we have a lot of curriculums that we use inside prison and also in the community. And, <clears throat> mm -hmm. you know, Creative Acts is also, uh, there's training. So we've also trained like corporations and we've trained mm -hmm. um, correctional officers and probation officers using an arts-based approach. But there are many simple things people can do. The main thing, and this is just a human thing that you can do, the main thing I would say is that if you are in a conversation where you're starting to feel defensive or upset or, um, Oh, I think Ashley just fell over. Yes, yes. <laughs> <You are Ashley. laughs> or, you know, defensive or upset or uncomfortable or scared, even if you can't identify it, you feel something, you know, bubbling up. Just stop for a second. Just do not speak. Don't speak at that moment. Just take a breath and just sit with that feeling. That's the most important immediate thing you can do because the thing that stops progress is responding to that right away. And a lot yeah. of what we do, you know, because we work in the four emotional states, happy, angry, sad, and afraid. And a lot of what we are doing is retraining ourselves in how to respond. So that's the first step is always take a breath. Don't respond to your first impulse. And then just, this is a time to just listen, whatever you think, because honestly, all of that, it's just feelings, it's just feelings. You're angry, you're defensive, you feel uncomfortable, scared. It's just feelings, they will not kill you. But the actions that are happening to us will kill us. So it's time to just listen. And that is very difficult to do. <laughs> but it's, it's interesting, I mean, the words truth and conciliation process keeps coming up in my, my head at the moment. But we always associate that with these, you know, uh, grand moments of the fall of apartheid or the fall of communism. But I'm trying to think of another way to express it, you know, uh, as to mm -hmm. what is actually what you would, what a, a city or a region or a nation or a state would institute. What would the, is, is, it, is it just education? Is it training? Is it, um, I mean, you're an artist, you're a performer. Is there, is there something you would want to take out into the world? 
that would um, well, that would actually, have that effect, you know? We're working on a truth and reconciliation ah, process okay. for America. Um, I was fortunate enough to be a, a Rockefeller a resident in Bellagio in Italy last year for a month. And one of the other residents was this amazing gentleman called Dikang uh, Mosinecki, who was uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court in South Africa. And he was in prison with Nelson Mandela. Wow. And he was one of the people responsible for making the constitution for South Africa. And so he, I asked him a lot about that process because it wasn't entirely successful in South Africa as much as it was, say, in Rwanda. Um, and so I asked him about the process. And it was very interesting because I said, you know, I really want to do something in America like that. And I'm not alone. There's several people like Brian Stevenson who is working on these things. Um, and he said, I said, why wasn't it successful, as successful as it could have been? And he said, because we did this whole very difficult, very painful process, you know, and the poor farmer came from out in the countryside from his barren farm and talked about not being able to plant his crops and, you know, went through the, you know, the whole process. And then the farmer went back to his same farm with the same barren crops and nothing had changed for him that you know, or her, that moment. Mm. And he said the reason it wasn't successful is because we didn't attach reparations to it. Ah, he said, you must to ask. Have yes. reparations <laughs> to have a successful change. And so now we're at this point in, certainly in the US, and I think it is leading into other countries, the UK as well, um, where it's already starting to bubble up. You know, I'm hearing politicians want to do this kind of process and, in communities and in cities and in states that, you know, really trying to reimagine defunding the police and what that looks like. And a lot of it is talking about taking money from policing and reinvesting it in communities. Mm -hmm. That's reparations and that's the beginning of reparations. Sure. And, and just finally, because we're just two minutes away from opening it out to people. Oh, um, is that we in, at the Alternative UK? We're really interested in sort of asking, asking for forgiveness, not permission, when it comes to levels of government. So, if a community feels that it has to do something, it should try to figure out how to do it. So, I'm not even going to speak of the top level government that's hanging over you at the moment. But <laughs> please don't. <laughs> no, but but so, but things can happen at lower levels in the in the US, and something like, like a city could take this up, or a, or a state could take this up as a, as a plan. That's possible, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I, I always try to, as a European, well, formerly European person, I try to look at the states as like Europe. Each state is like a different country here, right? So there's a whole thing about states' rights, mm. and it's, it's Which can be negative, can't it? Yeah. Can be negative. Yes. Yeah. But right now, during the coronavirus, it's actually been amazing because, because we have no central leadership, we'll leave that as it is, each of the states and the cities and the counties have had to do their own thing. And so you're seeing a lot of governors and mayors stand up um, and make policy and make decisions. And some real stars have come out of this time, you know. Um, and I think that, yes, it has to be a bottom-up thing. That's not even bo bottom-up, that's still elected leadership. Yeah, yeah. But there, it is happening in communities. Um, it has to be that way, but you also have to have the federal level because uh, whatever changes are made, we have to enshrine in law so that when you get a freak person stealing an election, um, they, can't, they can't change those things. So, uh, or they can, but it's a much longer process. So we need both in order to really make this deep change. But the most important thing is the individual level. Families, I'm hearing people say, you know, we're talking about racism for the first time in our families. You know, it's important that um, you have a connection to the justice, so-called justice system. You know, it's important, it's super important to talk to people who don't have the same life experience. So I guarantee, Almost everybody knows somebody who's been incarcerated. Seek them out and talk to them. Don't talk to them, listen to them. Don't say anything. Ask them their story and let them tell you the reality that you do not know. I've been doing this work 15 years inside American prisons and children's prisons and in reentry. 
I am still constantly learning and amazed by what I don't know. And I think that, you know, the good thing about the coronavirus is that the entire world now is in a place of not knowing. I don't have answers and anyone who says they do, they're lying. Nobody has any answers right now. And this is a really brilliant time to completely reimagine what could it be? How would I, how could I contribute to this change? What do I want this change to be? To be radical in our vision and to look at it from 50, 100, 300 years in the future, looking back, what do we want that to be like? What is that legacy like? And then to take action. And on that utopian note, Sabra, thank you very much. <laughs> Reality. <laughs> there's, no point, there's no point not having space rockets and 300 year time scales at the end of discussions. That's always my favorite way to end a discussion. <laughs> um, thank you. Indra, Indra, I think Indra wants to ask a question. Is there anything you wanted to pick up before we send it out to everybody? Uh, Indra, did you want to pick up something? Yeah, I mean, just a, a really quick question because you've, you've covered a huge amount of ground there and um, I'm very inspired as I always am. But um, imagining you in prison, I, I wanted to ask the question, with regards to your whole vision, is there anything specific about being a woman doing this work? Not a small um, question, sorry. Do you mean, what do you mean by doing this work? Well, doing the work that you're doing, is there, you know, is, is there also a, f a, f a female revolution involved, implied there, or does it impact the work that you're doing in prison? I just wonder what being a woman doing your work feels like yes it's always required extra training because we mainly work in men's prisons although we do work in women's prisons too and these are um often i never speak on behalf of people who are incarcerated so my impression is that uh there's a lot of toxic masculinity involved in gang culture for instance or what it is to be a man and very often when we go in, we do intense training so that um, we can leave our own judgments and our own ideas out of it and have a clear line between us. So that means that we never ask and we don't allow the conversation of why are you here? What have you done? Because they've already been judged. That's none of my business, right? So my, I always go in under the uh, idea that this may be the first really healthy relationship with a woman. And so I bear a lot of responsibility in how I respond and my relationship. So what we've always done is keep the work front and center. We don't have chit chat about our own lives or, you know, I, I've worked with people for 10 years inside and when they come out, they don't know anything about me and I don't know anything about them. They don't know I'm married, they don't know I have a kid. And that is such a joy to, you know, discover when you come out. And to me, I always think that's such a win because we've worked for 10 years together and we've really just been working. And we have this very, um, in the room because it's a safe space and it's about the work, not about personalities. Uh, there's this real amazing agape love that happens in the room and it's not a sexual love and it's not confusing in any way. It's just a human love that happens that makes this transformation in in the students and in myself and the teachers possible. I do think I have learned. I always think I can change anything and that's, I try to continue with that thought, but I have learned after years of trying to change things in certain places that sometimes I'm not the vessel that can change it because then I've seen a white man come in and say exactly the same things I've said and the person I'm trying to talk to has been like, oh my God, of course, that's genius. <laughs> and so I think that, you know, that's why you need allies. You know, I have to understand what I can do. And sometimes being a woman is the best thing. Sometimes that's the thing that can change it. But, you know, I'm sure you know, and any woman on this call who's doing any kind of work knows, I've been called, you know, a bitch or, you know, uh, or she's a ball breaker or she's this or, you know, that they would never, ever, ever say about a man. And so to me, I have to just, I've trained myself to be like, oh, that's more about you than it is about me. And I'm still just going to continue. So I think it has advantages and it has a lot of disadvantages, but with the work as the center, 
all of that can move to the side and be dealt with after. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Yeah, more than. Thanks very much, Sabra. Well, listen, I think we, we have so many interested and interesting people here. We'll want to give you a chance to put some questions to Sabra. Um, uh, this is about 15 minutes um, and then we'll break out into breakout rooms so you can all meet each other and then we'll come back after that. But the way we'd like to do it is if people would just like to put their, type their names into the chat screen at the side, the little chat icon at the bottom, we'll raise a, a screen to the right. And if you just put your names in one after the other, just your names, nothing else, and then that will enable us to come to you to, uh, to get your question out of you. So if you could start doing that now, that would be great. And we'll start to sort of pass the credit. We'll start to kind of uh, go to you and your boxes. So, go. Marina, thank you for posting that link. That's a good link. <laughs> so only if if you have a question to ask, put your name in the box. Okay, that's great. Names are coming through. Keep them coming. Um, first one is Des. Des, do you want to uh, unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, thank you very much. That was. Uh, Really interesting, and I've got a million questions. Just one, um, just I one. know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but so, okay, my main one is, um, I, I'm, I just want to know, because you're using the arts, and um, my question is, how do I, uh, with, with my community and people who are not into the arts, I'm being realistic here, do, do you know what I mean? I, I want to know how can I find a way to work with them as you say you, you know to uh, approach them and say you know how you've been in about privilege because not everybody will be open to this and i want to reach the people those who are closed do, do you know what i mean so in realistically in my daily life how, how do i how do i do that I, i'm not into the work that you do That's how do we best. reach people in the streets Cool. It's a great question. I'm actually writing a book. <laughs> so one day I'll be able to say, read the book. But well, not yet. Not for a while. Um, so what I would say, Des, first of all, is that none of, the, well, I would say maybe five of the thousands of people that I've worked with over the years have any interest in the arts at all or being an artist. And this is what I think is the most important part of the work is um, using the tools of the arts for self-described non-artists. That's why the arts need to be in the core of the school day. It's for people who are not interested in the arts. So it's not like I go in and say, okay, we're all going to do theatre. I'm going to teach you how to be an actor. That's not what it is. So in your situation, you, you know, I teach at UCLA um, sometimes. And one of the things I do is that, you know, the, the name of the workshop might be something like you're saying, like, you know, understanding race or understanding mm. privilege. And then I, ha I would use a series of exercises to have difficult conversations. For instance, there's this exercise that um, I invented called foldovers that came from, um, I, was trying, I was working with young girls who were incarcerated and I was like, what did I like to do when I was their age? And I remember when I was at school, I used to like to do that thing where you'd write something, fold it over, pass it to the next one and somebody else would write something. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, this is gonna be a good way to have an anonymous conversation about race. Mm -hmm. So um, I would put prompts like, you know, I am, my community is, and then write them all out on a piece of paper. And then you'd write, however whatever it means to you right i am you'd write whatever your sentence is turn it over pass it to the next one my community is and then the person would write that mm -hmm. and on and on and on around the circle and then uh we put them all in the middle and you go and get one and you have to read it like it's your manifesto and the first time we did it was so beautiful it was this big black woman from south la and she stood there and her first thing she said I am a white woman of privilege was the first thing on the thing. And she had to read the whole thing like it was her manifesto with like emotion and conviction. And it seems like a really crazy thing, but it's a very uh, simple way to have an anonymous, difficult conversation without mm. people being put on the spot. Mm. That's mm. one exercise. And we do like a lot of poetry writing. Mm. And then you can take that and you can make it um, dialogue. And that again, this is why it's so beautiful to be a partner, not a professor. Um, 
you know, that happened by accident. Someone was reading, two people went up at the same time and I was like, both of you take a piece of paper, read one line each. And it turned into a dialogue. I'm a white woman of privilege. I live in the ghetto. My thoughts were, you know, and it was this beautiful discussion that they had. And then we can turn it into a scene and into a play. So that's ways of, um, that's just one way, but that's how we use the arts, particularly for people who are not interested. <laughs> You got to finish that book, Sabra. You got to finish that book. Yes, please. Uh, okay. I know, I know, I know. Okay, next question, uh, Marina. Marina, if you want to yeah. unmute yourself. Thank you. Hi, Sabra. Thank you so much for that. It was uh, really brilliant. Um, I just want to ask you about this picture that's, um, I don't know if you saw it, possibly not because you're in America, but it's been all over the papers from Saturday when there were some um, racist and uh, far right marches and protests in central London and there was this image of this anti-racist protester or a black man carrying an injured white yeah, saw it. yeah yeah you saw it and everyone who's from here would have seen it now I have worked all you know for the last decade and more in the whole world of compassion empathy and forgiveness is my raison d'etre it's the sort of image I would have shared widely and yet I felt really uncomfortable about it. I felt it was a complete distraction. I didn't think it was helpful, but I just wondered what your take, it, you know, was I misreading it? You know, I just, it felt like everyone wanted it all to be fine. And that picture showed this loving, extraordinary moment. It's a very arresting image and it got the headlines. And there was something I just felt uncomfortable about. I want to know what you think. I felt hugely uncomfortable about it too. Um, I didn't post it. Um, it's the same, we have the same thing here of cops kneeling, you know, or walking with protesters. And I understand that it's inspiring. And I understand it makes people feel good. And you should feel good. And you should feel inspired. It's great. And also... So I have to ask myself, I'm not completely understanding why I feel so uncomfortable about it. I've been contemplating it for the last couple of days, but I think it's because any excuse not to do the work, any excuse is taken and run with. And I think that, um, like you say, a distraction. I think that people, when that is happening right now in a place where people feel super uncomfortable because they're seeing things for the first time, even though it's been happening for 400 years, seeing things for the first time, finally not gaslighting people when they tell, uh, tell you, you know, this is going on. I think the feeling of guilt and shame and fear means that any little detour is going to be taken. So I think that um, I agree with you. I think we have to say, as we're running on forward and be like oh that's lovely great and keep running oh that's yeah great good that the cops are doing that yeah. have we got systemic change yet nope we haven't you know okay and you know i think that um for me this time is a lot about holding people accountable every organization that has made a statement about black lives matter of which there are many that's another way of distracting from doing the work often so it might not be but if you have issued a statement, the ones that haven't, I'm like, okay, we see who you, who you are, but I can see the ones who've issued a statement are trying. So I'm gonna now, not just me, we are gonna hold you accountable. So now I want to see your board. What does your board look like? I wanna see the people who have power, not the population you're working with, which is what people do to try and get grants and say they're diverse. I wanna see the board, I wanna see your staff, and I wanna see if it's gonna change. And I think that's how we have to be, and that's why, we can't do this work on our own. We're already exhausted. We need you to do that. We need you to jump in and be like, that's so great that you cops are kneeling. Let's look at your police department. What's the chief of police look like? Yeah, I'm, brilliant, I'm thank going, you. I'm going to, there's another, there's another two questions here before we start to break the breakouts. Um, Harley, Harley, could you unmute yourself and ask your question, please? Hi, Sabra. Hi, it's so good to see so, all these old friends. Uh, so, sort of two aspects really one is in america most funding as far as i'm aware comes sort of through philanthropic um uh funding and i just wondered how hard it is although i sort of know it is hard 
but how hard, how much time do you spend trying to get the money? Because we, we know once you've got the money, you can do the work. But then the constant justifying, so that's one bit. And the other bit is, have you got like a game like you did with the folding paper of the, um, actually this, the game could work as well, with the splitting of the them and us, of the we get it and you guys don't, and this sort of um, unconscious condemning. <laughs> So who's them? Who's you mean as them? Um, well, if you're, I guess if you're, if you're white, um, and you think you're doing your best, then you could be under the the condemned because you haven't done enough, or you could perceive yourself to be that, and the them therefore are the others. I you know, see. So it's the sort of othering which happens within every kind of grouping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. Um, I'm gonna answer that bit first because the funding bit, oh, God, that's my thing, that's my jam. Okay, um, so the them and us thing, okay. Nobody is condemned. There is no condemning going on. There is questioning. There is 400 years of anger and grief and frustration and sadness, which sometimes comes out like condemning. But any person who wants to change themselves right now, even if they feel that they've been condemned in the past, will be welcomed with open arms if you're actually doing the work. You know, I think Martin Luther King said it and it's been said a lot of times. The most dangerous group of people are the people who think they have it. And honestly, at this point in history, I'm gonna just put it out there. I don't think any white people have done their work or enough of their work at this point because everybody has benefited from white supremacy or white people have benefited from white supremacy at this point and like i say i've been working inside prison for 15 years i've been doing the work intensely and hard and i would never think that i've got it never i'm constantly having to do this work this is a way of living not a time in history so we have to put ourselves on a course which is the work and that's what I'm saying. It's not like work is a word that sounds like, oh, it's such hard work or, you know, am I, I'm going to get to the end of it and then I'm going to graduate. No, it's a way of living that brings joy, but only if you're in it. And you can tell if you're in it because joy will start to emerge. So, you know, the white progressive liberal people in the past have been described as being the most dangerous. And I hear it a lot, especially from a bunch of artists who think they're woke. There is no group that is better than other groups within this work. There is people who have to do more work because they haven't done it or they haven't been doing it consistently. And then, you know, black people are doing work. Like I said, we're all doing work all the time too. So that I think, you know, as far as othering, it's all part of the same thing. It's all fear. It's all feeling uncomfortable, just wanting to be right. And I would say the same thing. When, if you feel you're the person who's got it, you have not got it. <laughs> That's the first part of it, I would say. As far as the funding, there's a whole revolution happening in funding right now because of COVID-19, right? So what foundations have shown is that they are actually able to be, surprised, very nimble and uh, much faster and require less reporting. They've, they've made a lot of programming dollars into general support dollars for the first time. So they've shown they can do it and now we're gonna hold them accountable for continuing to do it. Um, I, I see people want to change, but in foundations, again, I think it's 97% of boards and foundations are white and most of them are white men. So there's this revolution that has to happen in every system. It's not one system. We have the justice system. We have the philanthropy system. We have the education system. We have the medical system. They are all constructs. They've all been constructed and generally by the people who are in power, who are the same people. So the whole thing has to change together. And uh, we're working on philanthropy. <laughs> we're also holding them accountable. I just asked the California um, Arts Council for data about who they're funding 
what do the boards look like not what they're telling you about their diversity but what do their boards look like what do their executive directors look like and they told me they're not allowed to give out that information I was like fine there are websites so we're gonna have people who are allies search their websites and find out that data for them so that's what we have to do and it's a lot of work I've got a whole another thing to say about funding which I will I won't say now <laughs> Um, I just we just have about a few minutes left. I just want to make sure that people who have flagged up that they want to ask uh, ask a short question and get a short answer. So, last person before we're going to break out is Ashley. Ashley, could you unmute and ask a question, please? Hi there. Hi, Sabra. Thank hi. you. I'll try and keep. Hi. I'll try and keep it short. Uh, I, I suppose it goes back to the issue of distraction as well. Um, you know, when we've got the, uh, the the pulling down of the statues. Um, I have um, two family members who I have um, consequently kind of recently fallen out with um, challenging them because they are sort of fixated and engaged with the, uh, the uh, issue of changing history. They claim not to be racist. Um, they are very defensive and I find myself becoming very defensive. My partner's black. My son is black and white. And... Um, you know, you said earlier about, you know, um, you know, when you become defensive, don't speak. Do you mean on both sides? And, um, you know, what I'm angry about is that, you know, those family members are not wanting to listen to either me or engage with seeking to hear what my partner's reality has been. Thank you. Well, they're not willing to engage yet. That doesn't mean that they'll never be and no I don't mean <clears throat> I don't mean be silent in that situation I mean be silent if you're feeling attacked yourself um, by people of color and be more specific um, as far as the statues go that's not history as you know has been said many times history is is written by the victors so that's not history a lot of those statues were built in the 1970s so that's all a bunch of BS. That's not, not true. Um, and, you know, I think that a lot of times it's, it's not just pulling down of those statues, which has happened across the world, by the way. It's um, deciding who we want to celebrate, right? The statues are built to celebrate a myth right now. And, um, you know, again, it's one of those things that, if, if an indigenous person walks by a statue of Christopher Columbus, that's not the same as if you would walk by, or you know, somebody who, who is not affected by that history walks by it. That's like adding salt into the wound, right? They have to walk by a, a person who uh, was the beginning of a genocide. More Native American people died in that genocide than did in the Holocaust. Right? We don't have statues up of Hitler praising Hitler. That's the reality of the history. So if you want history, there are books you can read which are from the point of view of the conquerors. If you really want that history, go ahead and read that book. You do not need a statue in a public place with public money to celebrate murderers and people who've committed genocide. That, I mean, that's the only way that I can put it. And actually, to be honest, at this point, I don't care what the people who don't like those, who want those statues there think anymore. I don't care. Those are going to come down and we can have a discussion about why. So, yeah. So, and I'm sorry about your family. I know it's really difficult. It's really difficult, especially, I don't know how old your child is, but, you know, I had to give our son the talk and uh, it's really tough. It's a really tough position to be in, but I'm glad that you're not just letting them continue with their views. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that question, Ashley. There are a few more questions, but we'll come round to them after the, we do the breakouts. Uh, Roxy had a question. Roxy, do you want to unmute yourself and ask the question that you wanted to ask? Yeah, hiya. Um, I just wanted to ask if you have any tips for um, getting more people of colour onto boards. In the UK? In the UK, okay. yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So I want to just make a point. I've been thinking about this. Um, representation is important. It's not only representation. As you may have seen, black cops are killing black people too. 
right? It's systemic. It's a systemic change. So what I really would be sad to see is just a, people just grabbing black people and being like, be on my board. I've got to have a black face on my board. That's not really doing the work. So the first step is to ask the questions, why don't you have people of color on your board? You know, why don't you, do you have people of color on your staff? Are you serving a community that has a lot of people of color? So then why don't they have the power? Why don't they have the power of being on a board or being an executive director? So for me, I'm raising people in the population that I work with, training them to become leaders so that they can sit on boards and they can be executive directors. Because a lot of what's happened in the past is that, you know, people who have all of the, you know, potential and all of the uh, intelligence and everything that you need, and also, by the way, lived experience, are not, uh, not given, given any tools or training or education how to do those jobs. So we think, oh, well, they're not ready for it, so we can't appoint them. But rather than that, let's give them those tools, because the reality is it's not that hard to train. What we shouldn't be doing is just dumping people saying, okay, you're a black person, now you're the executive director, because that's a way to make people fail and then say, see, it doesn't work when we have people of color that are not good at it. So I think that it's, you know, asking the questions first, why are they not there? And then how can I train people so that they are able to be successful in these positions? And they're there, even in Devon or Cornwall, or Devon, I think you said that you're living in. I know several people of color who live in Devon. There are people there for sure. Okay, I'm going to go through the boards and could you start waving furiously if you want to report back from your group? And then we can, you can speak up. I'm going back to the boards. Is anybody waving furiously who wants to report back from their groups? If not, we have a, I have a question to the side. Last chance. Last chance. Okay, the question from the side was from uh, David Hare. Uh, maybe, David, if, if you're on, do you want to maybe unmute yourself and ask the question? Uh, hi, uh, hi, Sabra, can you hear me? David, yes. Hi, nice to see you. Great to see your smiley face. Happy memories of talking to you a couple of years back about, about some of this stuff. I, I know when we spoke a couple of years ago, and I've seen you mention it, I think on Facebook, you, you talk about the talk that you, you've you given to Kai, I think. Uh, and it, might, it just struck me that quite some people in the group might not be aware of what that is, but it seems to me pretty significant. I think you did just mention it um, in the group's thing before. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Um, I'm purposely not explaining what the talk is because Google exists. Um, however, I will, in this situation, I will briefly say what it is. But in the future, like anybody, anybody, if you hear anything like that, anywhere else, go to Google first because the labor of people of color right now explaining everything to everybody all the time is a lot of labor. I'm just then I'm not tired, so I'm like willing to say. Um, so the talk is something that people who have young, uh, raising young people of color, particularly young men of color, have to give to their children to give them the best chance of not being murdered by cops. So for instance, my husband and I agonized for a month after Trayvon Martin was murdered about giving the talk to our son, who was I think 12 at the time. When you give the talk to your child, you have to say to them, if you're in a car or you get stopped by a cop, you have your, your license on the dashboard, you don't make any fast moves, you don't reach into the glove compartment or into your pockets, you do everything that the cop asks you to do without resisting in any way. You say, yes, sir, no, sir, all because we don't want him to shoot you or her to shoot you. That's the only reason that you do those things. And the reason why the talk in itself is um, uh, an injustice is because Kai's best friend's mom didn't even know what the talk was. She didn't have to know. Meanwhile, my husband and I are agonizing over, we don't want him to feel different. We don't want him to feel scared. We don't want to set him up against the cops from such a young age. And the worst thing about it is after we gave Kai the talk, 
he said, yes, mum, I know, because Trayvon. And so he already knew, and that is heartbreaking. So that's what the talk is, and that's why it's super important to understand that there's this whole world that's been invisible to you that we are having to deal with and we're not talking about. Imagine then if I have to sit down and be like, oh yeah, we had to give Kai the talk today. Because, you know, that is like, that sucks. <laughs> we don't tell you about it, but we've been dealing with this forever. That's what the talk is. Okay, thank you. We... And I should, sorry, can I just add one thing? Sure, sure. Um, the one thing I want to say is, you're gonna make mistakes. You're going to say things that you feel bad about afterwards or say things that you should not have said or that you could have said in another way or, you know, ask questions that are difficult or might get a angry response or a sad response, you might make someone cry. That is part of the journey. And again, it's just feelings. If you, you're just like, you know, everybody, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to say the wrong things. You have to be like, okay, I'm going to suck that up. That was a mistake. I should not have done that. And I've learned from it. And now I'm going to go forward. But you are going to make mistakes. And do not let that be the off-ramp for you from doing this work. That's what I want to say. OK. Um, any, could anybody raise their hands? Um, is there anything that people want to say? Otherwise, Andrew and I will start steaming in with questions. OK. Uh, there's Sam. Sam? Brother Sam? Uh, there we go. Hello. Um, so I just thought what we were talking about in our little room, uh, that maybe this is, this is just a sort of uh, kind of question to everyone, see if anyone's got any ideas about it, about, um, about, you know, there's a certain type of person who might be willing to come along to a discussion like this. Um, and as you say, for, for lots of people, it, it's, it's hard work to do to kind of get over that hump and to acknowledge your privilege and to all these things like you say, and maybe you might say the wrong thing sometimes. But then there are also a lot of people, especially in positions of power, who may have got to those positions of power because, precisely because they are intransigent and they don't want to listen and they are so sure of their opinions and they don't want and how do you how do you reach those people and how do you get through to them I, I don't know if there's any kind of like super sophisticated psychological techniques or something to uh with, without kind of just getting angry or or ending up not speaking to them anymore uh because they turn away from you um so yeah that's just that's something we were talking about I mean, partly in response to Ashley's experience with her family members, uh, but yeah, as a more kind of general thing, and particularly relating, as I say, to the way kind of power structures work quite often, I think, is to kind of reward people who seem to be, who won't kind of think too much about themselves, but will just feel they know that they're doing the right thing. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. There's, a, there's a plethora of different ways and I think that all of the different ways have to be utilized so some people it was the 13th some people saw the 13th and were like oh my god this thing is like you know so, mm. so for some people it's through the arts they might see a play or read a book or see a film that changes the landscape for them some people it might be a conversation with somebody that they care about particularly who looks like them that's where the allyship is so important because if I have the same conversation you do, people are going to feel extra threatened because they're looking mm -hmm. at a person of color and they're having a conversation about race, whereas it might be easier hearing it from an ally. Um, that's another way. Some other ways are they have a child that's born into their family who's um, a mixed race or a person of color or is adopted into their family, or they travel. For Americans, less than 20% of Americans travel, have passports. It's super important to travel. You travel somewhere and you're able to have a conversation with somebody who doesn't look like you in a place that's not in your bubble. So I think all of those play, all of, there's many, many more than that. Mm -hmm. But we have to put people in a position where they're able to see those things. So we have to be able to make films that 
people are going to see in a wider audience, not just the same old audience seeing it, which is starting to happen, right? We're starting to see the Hollywood industry starting to change only because they're under intense pressure, but nevertheless, it's happening. And then the other thing is that I, until this week, I hadn't unfriended anybody. I've had lots of conversations with lots of people <laughs> on social media mm. and mostly we've been able to make some progress usually in private messages, but we've mostly been able to make some progress. But this week I actually did unfriend somebody for the first time who I used to know. Well, I don't even really remember them, but somehow they've gone my friend list. <laughs> and this person was, you know, starting with the all lives matter thing. Please never, ever, ever respond to anything with all lives matter. We know that it's black lives matter too. And he was, he, as we, I, I respond with data and facts, right? And try, like, I keep the emotional side out of it. And the further we went, the closer we got, he was responding to a white woman who was coming in with the same stuff and being like, okay, I guess I hear you a bit, but you're wrong and you're being emotional, you know, whatever, <laughs> she's a woman. But to me, he was getting more and more personal. Oh, you've always been like this. You've always been this person. I don't like you. It's not because you're all... And it just got more and more personal to the point that I was like, okay, well, I'm not the person to deliver this. And I have to unfriend mm -hmm. him. That's the first time. But I think that, you know, what I've noticed is that my white friends jumping in on these conversations, it's, I can't tell you how beautiful it is when that happens and how much more heard they are and how I feel like, oh my God, I'm not doing all the labor on my own. It's just such mm -hmm. a very emotional for me when I see that happen. So please do that help people out please do that and yeah i mean i just think there's a million ways to people's hearts but we have to make the space where they can receive them there's a million ways to people's hearts and we just have to make the space to receive them as a closing line that's not bad Sabra <laughs> williams uh, could you all please uh, wave your hands or applaud or express your appreciation Ooh. in some way shape or form not all with your microphones on otherwise zoom explodes Thank you so much, everybody, for coming along to uh, The Elephant Meets, uh, run by The Alternative UK, www.thealternative.org.uk. Thanks so much to uh, my co-initiator, um, Indra, and uh, to our colleague, um, Maria Rothiaskov, uh, for helping to make this possible. Uh, please do join us as a co-creator, where we, you can help to fix a broken politics. And it's broken, but as Sabra shows, it can be fixed. Um, so that's us. We're done. If you want to hang on afterwards, you're more than welcome. But otherwise, I've been Pat Kane. Thank you very much. Goodbye. I just want to say thank you so much to Pat just for beautifully guiding this conversation and to Indra for asking me and for Maria for keeping this all going and to all of you for taking this time. Thank you for taking this time and for participating. <laughs>